Back in the old days, we used to be like, fuck yeah, sequels. Sequels used to be the only way we got more of the games we loved, so we were always excited when they were announced. In 2018, sequel announcements are like, hmm, hmm. The live service model has changed how we view games. Now we bring a healthy skepticism to sequel announcements and ask whether or not a sequel was really needed at all, or if the sequel is just a cynical attempt to milk more cash, either through the ticket price or through new monetization models. I know this is a pessimistic view, but it's a fact. We don't look at sequels with the same unchecked enthusiasm that we're used to because we've been burned so many times recently. For me personally, I think I walk a fine line between being excited for the future of the games that I love, while also being on my guard about how much a sequel might not live up to my expectations. I'm a big believer in the idea that it's okay to be hyped about video games, but I'm also a big believer in the fact that we should never pre-order video games and we should certainly take a good look at a title before shelling out our hard-earned cash for it. So when Ubisoft invited me to E3 to go hands-on with The Division 2, I brought these two perspectives with me. I brought a tremendous amount of excitement to get my hands on the sequel to one of my favorite games ever, and the game to which I owe almost all of my success on YouTube, but I also brought a critical lens because I was keen to understand what would set this game apart from its predecessor, and having been personally burned with Destiny 2, I was keen to see if Massive were on track to repeat the mistakes that Bungie had made. Now, I'm very pleased to say that having spent a few hours with the game and having spoken extensively to almost every member of the senior development team working on the sequel, I think things are tracking in an excellent direction, and there are plenty of reasons that I'm very optimistic about the future of The Division. When I walked out of the Destiny 2 reveal event in early 2017, I immediately said that I was deeply uncomfortable with what I had seen, as it looked like too few advancements were being made, and the changes that were highlighted seemed like steps backwards rather than steps forward. I can confidently say that nothing I saw in the Division 2 reveal felt like a step backwards, and the advancements that were revealed seemed like fantastic, game-changing improvements that will enlarge the Division experience in a meaningful way. I'm obviously not saying the sequel is great, because we don't know nearly enough about it yet, but I can say that I think it's looking great, and if the development team can deliver on everything that's been shown or discussed, then I think we're going to have a pretty damn good sequel on our hands. So let's talk some of the details. Visually, there was a lot of concern about how good the gameplay trailer looked, and whether or not there would be some sort of visual downgrade at launch. Well, I played on a max setting PC, and you can see the gameplay comparison here on screen. Now, clearly, the trailer footage has some effects enabled that are making it look better than the stock standard gameplay, but I don't think there's too much trickery going on here. I think the biggest difference is that we're seeing the trailer at sunset, which creates these beautiful lighting effects that work especially well against the water that we're trudging through, or the sun itself as it peeks in and out of view behind Air Force One. I think anyone that's played the original game will recall how wildly the visual impact of this game can vary based on lighting, with sunsets in particular being just phenomenal in the Snowdrop engine. This game was always stunning, and I think The Division 2 is going to be equally stunning, but it's definitely not a huge step up. The game does look slightly better, but only to those that really know how the game looked before. I'm sure more casual observers will think it looks the same, which is fine because it sort of is, but for diehard fans, you'll definitely notice a subtle increase in visual fidelity, which is of course always great. Knowing that we'll have performance improvements for the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One X versions is also really nice. The setting. I'm really pumped for this. Washington. I know a lot of people were disappointed to leave New York City behind, and on some level I am as well. There were lots of locations left unexplored in the endless metropolis of New York, and we could have made great hay out of those if we had the chance. But I want my sequels to feel different, and I think a change of scenery is a really effective way to do that. Washington fits with the Division's theme so perfectly. I mean, it's a Tom Clancy game, so where better to put it than in the seat of American power? There's just so much that you can do with this, like Capitol Hill and the White House and the Washington Monument and Lincoln Memorial, the Smithsonian, Andrews Air Force Base, the Supreme Court. I mean, Washington is built as this big ode to Imperial Rome, and you have the Division agents crawling over and through these wrecked monuments. That's just fucking awesome, and I'm totally down for that. I think it was a great choice. In terms of the game's feel, it does feel slightly different. I noticed that player locomotion was heavier, and I asked the developers about this, and they confirmed that they'd redone the way our player moves, including animations. It takes slightly longer for your character to get moving now, but in a good way that feels realistic, not at all sluggish. Hopefully, and we won't be able to confirm this before launch, 
These changes to animations also remove the chicken dance that plagued the PvP experience. That would be pretty great because the chicken dance was definitely one of the worst and most meme-worthy parts of the game. I almost immediately noticed that weapon sounds were different this time around. Again, I asked the devs what's up with that and they inform me that they've re-recorded or redesigned almost every weapon sound in the game. I was surprised to hear this because I always thought that the weapons sounded fine in the past, but hey, they sound better now, so I'm not complaining. Enemy design was where I noticed the biggest changes. You still have your standard grunts with different weapons, but new enemies have been added, like guys who spray this sticky foam stuff all over you and lock you down in place. I got caught out by these guys on numerous occasions, and when you're stuck, you can't take cover, even if you're right next to cover. I then got blown the fuck up. The new enemy with destructible armor are also really awesome, and the fact that enemy medics can now revive fallen comrades is great, but it was the intelligence of the enemies that I noticed the most. They're just smarter. They flank so aggressively in a way that I hadn't seen before. So again, I asked the developers, what's up with that? And I spoke with the lead AI programmer, Drew Cena, and he told me that they had redesigned enemy AI to be smarter and to hold different patterns of behavior depending on their faction. This faction likes to spread out and flank where other factions will prefer to bunker down and group up. We don't know what those factions are yet, but the fact that these sort of tactics exist in the first place is pretty awesome. The open world is something which the developer promises is going to feel a lot more alive this time around, but I haven't seen the evidence for that yet. The gameplay you're seeing here is a slice of the open world, and what's happening is that we're capturing a spot on the open world map, which will then provide needed supplies to civilians. What those supplies do, or what benefits civilians will provide us isn't clear, but it's a new feature in the game. What can also happen here is that if we didn't intervene in this conflict, civilians could independently capture this spot without us. We could arrive here when the battle is raging between this enemy faction and the civilians and choose to take part in it or not, and this is a tangible example of the living world that the developers are trying to build in contrast to the rather lifeless New York City. Almost all of this sounds great, but I think with features as ambitious as these, the proof is going to be in the pudding, and we'll definitely need to see how it all unfolds at launch. The game's RPG systems are getting a complete overhaul. There's almost nothing that's the same this time around, and I know that this has left a lot of people quite concerned. Marco Stahl, who, if you don't know him, is a big division YouTuber, he's worried that the developers were looking to dumb down a number of game systems and make them more casual friendly. So I put this question directly to the developers. Would you say that the game is striving to be, um, you know, more casual or streamlined? Or would you say the game is striving to be deeper, more complex, like a, 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 a beefier RPG? Where do you think it lands on that spectrum? Uh, I would not say more more casual in that sense. I think we, we're we very committed and focused on having depth, breadth and variability within within the gear game uh, and all the things that are part of the RPG system, the weapons, the gear, the skills, its mods and now also the specializations, right? So we're adding things on top of there that can act as leverage as well. Uh, we do however want to uh, we, 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 we set out to, to make it more accessible. Right. So it's about how you approach it and building complexity in layers mm. uh, and also tying you know, parts of how it works to things that are more intuitive uh, to just the human brain and things that we can relate to in the real, real world, and sure. which is, which is uh, you know, partially what's behind our, our changes to armor and, Got it. Uh, and things like that. From what I can tell, I think we're looking at deeper systems rather than stuff that's simpler. The developers are throwing out almost all of the high-end build talents and replacing them with stuff that's actually good, which will hopefully make high-end builds actually viable. The brand system, whereby each piece of armor has a manufacturer that provides specific stats or benefits, looks to complement the existing talent plus stat setup on our current gear. We also know that gear sets will be making a return and that the developers assure us that they're going to make us feel more powerful than ever before. 
but it's the introduction of specializations that really define the leap to this sequel. When you ding max level, you'll choose either an explosive crossbow, a grenade launcher, or the long awaited 50 cal sniper rifle as a foundational aspect of your build. I've used each of these and they all feel great in their own way. The way it works is that you constantly have these weapons available, but you don't have ammo. As you kill enemies, they'll drop special ammo and you can then unload with it. There were sometimes very long spells where this ammo just wasn't dropping, so don't expect it to be up all the time, but that's how it works. Now you can switch between specializations after you unlock each of them, so you aren't locked to one per character. But critically, there's a progression path within each specialization that allows you to further customize your build. So just because you're a sniper doesn't mean that you're the same as the next person, you're gonna have choices within that 50 cal specialization tree that allow you to define how you play. So if we take all of this in aggregate, from weapons to weapon mods to skills, and there are plenty of new skills by the way, to brands, to gear sets, to specialization, to specific choices within those specializations, I'm seeing the potential for more depth than ever before. Again, an important caveat, we don't know this yet, but from what I've seen, the RPG looks to be every bit as satisfying this time around, and for me, that's the reason that I play The Division. There's also endgame raids which have now been introduced into the sequel. We don't know what they are yet, the developers were tight-lipped about that, but they did say that they're going to be very reminiscent of the sort of, you know, Destiny slash World of Warcraft boss style raids, taking down multiple bosses per space, etc, etc. They also said it's designed specifically for the very hardcore player. These are not casual activities. I know that's going to upset some people, I'm sure everyone would like to be able to participate in a raid, but personally, I think that it is absolutely crucial that these activities are only for hardcore people who are willing to make the investment because it gives those people something to chase and it creates a rusted on, passionate community of people who really care about this game and are willing to show how much they're putting into it. I think it's the right call, but I do understand that not everyone's going to be a fan of it. On the PvP side, everything's a giant question mark at this point. We know the Dark Zone is returning, but that's about all we know. We don't know what changes might come to the Dark Zone, and I know a lot of people are very anxious about that, given how controversial the Dark Zone is. I wish I had more information to share, but sadly I don't, so all I can say is watch this space. I did ask about PvE and PvP balancing, however, since I'm of the firm belief that any game that merges these two is doomed to fail. PvP nerfs make the PvE game less fun, and PvE buffs can often result in wildly unbalanced PvP experiences. Here's what the developers had to say. Are there any intentions to balance PvE and PvP differently this time around? Or is it going to be the case like in the old days where it's always the same? We're looking at every tool in the toolbox to right. make sure that, that both experiences are the very best they can be. And, uh, but it shouldn't feel like two different games. Okay. Right, but uh, we... we uh, we're putting a lot of focus and effort on that. Absolutely. Okay. So, so and, and to take the Dorsen experience sure. to the next level. Right, right, right. So <laughs> it's possible that, you're, you're saying it's possible that PvE and PvP could be balanced separately. You're, you're exp you've got, you're, nothing's off the table is what no. you're saying. Nothing's off the nothing's table. Nothing's off the okay, table. Okay, right, cool, fair enough. So from that answer, it's unclear how the developers will approach this challenge, but I think it's great that they're keeping an open mind to potential approaches since the PvE versus PvP seesaw has been particularly painful with the Division 1. So all of this is looking great, but there were two very big concerns that I have at this point. The first relates to that old chestnut, monetization. Now, during the reveal at the Ubisoft press conference, creative director Julian Garrity said this. We learned a lot. We learned a lot from working on the first game. And with The Division 2, we're launching with plans for years of frequent major content updates. Today, we're ready to outline our plans for year one. We will be launching three DLCs in the form of episodes. Each one will bring new story, new areas to explore, and new activities. And the best part, all of these episodes will be completely free for everyone. This obviously is fantastic, but nestled away in the fine print was the mention of a premium pass with no information whatsoever on what this contains. I asked the developers what this meant and here's what they said. That a paid DLC model split the community in a way that I don't think is, is good for us in the short term, medium term or long term. So that, that's a, I think that's a huge learning that 
Uh, I don't think we're ever going to go back to normal. Right. So that's interesting because we know that there's also a premium pass which is available. Mm -hmm. So from that, can I infer that there's not going to be anything that will split the community within that premium pass at all? I'm I'm not 100% okay. on what that premium pass is, but philosophically, sure. No, there, yeah, there yeah. should never be anything that splits the community there. Okay. The fact that this pass will in no way separate players is fantastic. We're finally going to be able to move through this game as one united community. And this model stands in stark contrast to that being employed by Activision with both Call of Duty and Destiny, where their must-purchase DLC divides the community between the haves and the have-nots. However, until we know what this premium pass contains, we can't celebrate. Hopefully, it contains a mix of snazzy, purely optional cosmetics, but if it contains anything like special must-have weapons or armor, then that's going to be a pretty dick move, and UB Massive will have lost all the goodwill that this free DLC announcement will have generated. The second area of concern is how much content will ship at launch. Destiny broke new ground in the looter-shooter genre, but its sequel committed the cardinal sin of removing the majority of game systems that made the first game great. I put this question to the developers to see how much launch content they'd be willing to confirm. Certainly one of the biggest questions I have is just around the number of features they're going to ship at launch. We've had some other games that have you know, come out as sequels and they built up over time and then a lot of those features were removed and people felt very disappointed because they're like, well I'd, I'd love that feature, why is it gone now? Things like recalibration and you know, match made PvP and resistance and all that sort of stuff, is all of that going to exist at launch? What is, what is the approach you're planning on taking with those features? It's a, it's a tough question to, to answer. Now we need to go back and start working on how, what are we going to ship with right. for uh, March. Mm. So we've got a very, very uh, ambitious game. Uh, the scale of it is very big, mm. uh, content-wise and world-wise, activity-wise too. It'll be a much larger game than the first game at launch for sure. In larger in what sense? Uh, pretty much in every sense that we want to approach. So, so more missions? More, more activities, yep. more missions, more things to do, more worlds, more things to explore, yep. that type of thing. So right. scope-wise, pure content scope-wise, it's going to be more. Now, will we have absolutely every single feature from the Division plus two, launch, uh, two years of post-launch? No, there's right. no way that we're going to be able to, to hit that level of all of those features. Does it mean that we won't have those features eventually? No, because we'll probably work on things that are similar or tweaks of it. But what I can say is that this is the same team that did the Division 1. This is the same team that did the post-launch for Division 1. So all of those learnings, all of those lessons, uh, um, we're going to apply them to what we're going to launch with. While everything I've seen to this point gives me great cause for optimism, this response definitely left me feeling uneasy. You can't make a game as feature-rich as The Division 1 and then try and sell people a sequel that is significantly less feature-rich. Bungie tried it, and it blew up in spectacular fashion. As development continues and we see more and more of the game, this is the thing that I'm going to be paying closest attention to, because the success of this game will live and die based upon how much it expands the Division experience, not shrinks it. We're just not okay with seeing our live service games periodically shrink to justify the ticket price of a sequel. So I really hope that we get all or most of what made the original game so great when the sequel launches next year. And I suppose this brings us back to the point I made at the start of this video. How much do you dare to hype? Healthy skepticism is always a good thing and I definitely have plenty of that. But after having seen the game, played it extensively and spoken at length with senior developers, I'm just really, really optimistic about the future of the game. So many things just look like straight up improvements versus the first game. And if critical things like cheating, netcode, animations, Cronus Max and other exploits can be fixed, then this is going to be the best version of The Division we've ever played and a very worthwhile sequel. I'm really looking forward to that and I really hope that Massive are able to deliver.